Welcome to Quick Start, the show about fast booting laptops from the late 2000s and yet another episode about one that isn't from the late 2000s. But at this point, what else is new? <laughs> We've seen over the course of this series that maybe the whole fast booting thing never really got delivered on and also maybe the problem they were trying to solve never really existed to begin with. So, you know, who cares anymore? I'm, I'm not even gonna bother recapping the premise. You can catch up on the old episodes if you want. Let's just go hog wild. This here is an HP EliteBook 8440p from 2010, and it's actually appeared on this series before, all the way back in episode two, when I briefly demonstrated its quick web feature. That was HP's branding of Splashtop OS, a highly limited version of Linux that lived in a file and a folder on your hard drive and was used by about a half dozen PC and motherboard vendors over a few years before disappearing because it was absolutely goddamned useless. To refresh your memory, let's take a look at quick web. To get to Quick Web, we just press and hold this invisible capacitive button here that you can't even really see for a full second. Turns on. All right, and this is Quick Web. It's a web browser. There's nothing else. I'm not even gonna bother demoing this because it's too much effort to even get it on the Wi-Fi. It is literally nothing more than a web browser with expired TLS root certs. So there's nothing to see. And of course, in keeping with the rest of the series, it doesn't boot any faster than a normal operating system by any appreciable amount. For comparison, let's take a look at Windows 7. Noting of course that this is on a spinning disk, not an SSD. All right, in my tests, that was about 10 seconds slower for a total of 30 seconds. Oh no, you could starve to death in the time this machine takes to boot. Now I admit, this could get worse once the executive attached to it starts visiting online gambling sites and loads it down with malware, and even worse than that after the corporate network gets owned and IT reacts by installing their own malware, but even then I don't know that it would be that bad. I mean, this was 2010 after all. 7200 RPM hard drives were pretty common in laptops. That's what this shipped with and that's what I have in it. And you could even order it with an SSD, and I'm positive that would have improved boot times even after Enterprise IT got their hands on it. So no exotic solution was needed to make this machine usable. I think it was fine as is, it's just that someone at HP wanted to earn a bonus that year, a topic we'll come back to much later. In any case, you were unequivocally better off just using Windows or even Linux because at this point, both of them fully supported Standby and Hibernate and they could resume faster than even Quick Web could boot. Here, let's go to Standby. All right, and how long does that take to resume? <laughs> I actually expected a couple of seconds there, but no, it's negligible, so yeah. This feature was deeply underwhelming and it didn't rate more than a couple minutes of screen time in the last episode it was in, but that's because I didn't show you everything else going on with it. So I got this thing without a hard drive, right? And I had to install the OS from scratch and then I had to track down QuickWeb, which fortunately I was able to get from HP's website. But while I was there, I kept seeing mentions of this term quick look. And at first it wasn't clear if that was just another name for the same thing, but I realized that it wasn't when I learned that certain models, including mine, had a separate button just for launching it. You see, this is the normal power button, this is the button that launches Quick Web, and then this is the one that launches Quick Look. That's right, this laptop has three separate power buttons that each launch a different operating system. So yeah, that slaps, or at least 
it does if the other two OSs are any good, right? And we know that Windows 7 is all right, but we also know that Quick Web isn't. So how about Quick Look? Can it save this thing from mediocrity? No, it gives me no joy to report, th that's a lie. It gives me great joy to report this, but no, it will not save this machine. To its credit though, it does boot very quickly. Let's see it in action. All right, in my testing, that was about eight seconds. And in this case, it seems like it might've been more like four. And that might make it the fastest OS in the history of Quick Start. So we have a winner, <laughs> at least if it's actually useful, we do. So what does this actually do? Well, so um, it's Outlook. I mean, as the name implies, Quick Look is literally quick outlook. That's the whole point. So we have all the things you'd expect from an email client. Uh, we start up into this sort of dashboard uh, that shows us uh, calendar entries for today and a task list. I don't have anything pending. Or actually, no, I guess I do need to buy Oracle, but uh, that's, that's a whenever thing. But then if we go to these icons in the corner, these are all of our other tabs from Outlook. So this one here, this is our calendar. So we can add an event. And I can even add an attendee from my contact list. All right, and if we save that and then go back to our dashboard view, there we go, that shows up there. Uh, the attendee of course came from our contact list and we can edit that too over here. We can add a new contact. And this is pretty much uh, everything you'd expect from Outlook. There, I've added my cats, all three of them. There's also the to-do list over here, and we can add entries to that as you'd expect. And the last tab here is email. I had some viewers send me some emails to work with. So, all right, first off, we've got a recipe here for Cornish game hens. Uh, we also have a fan letter. Great video. Thanks for all the great content. I do try my best, thank you. But then things start to fall apart because this has an attachment. It's got a JPEG, but uh, it's not in line and if we click on it, nothing happens. We just can't view that. Uh, and things wouldn't be any better if it was a dot .doc or a PDF or, or anything like that. We can't do anything with attachments in here. And then if we go click on this last message here, this one also has an image, but it's included in line. So it actually is visible. The problem is it's so much higher resolution than the screen that I can't actually make anything out. And there's no way to shrink it or to make this window bigger. There are actually some cats in here, but at best you can make out an ear or a nose or a paw, but not a whole lot more. So this program is completely inflexible. The user interface is totally static the way it is. And that's pretty weird and limited. Also, we can go in here and compose an email. I can compose an email, but only in plain text. Uh, I can't attach anything. It, it will let me attach a signature at least, but obviously most of our normal email client functionality is missing here. And if I hit send, well, it doesn't really go anywhere. It just sort of goes into the shadow realm. There's no outbox, there's no sent items. In fact, if we go over to drafts, it shows up over here. That's uh, not really what I intended. And the thing is, I can tell you, if I were to check my phone right now, I wouldn't find this message in my inbox. And if I were to send an email uh, to this account, it wouldn't show up here because this machine isn't online. And not for lack of trying. It can't go online at all, ever. You may have noticed that there's no setup button in this UI. There's no options, the, there's nothing. There's just the actual interface panes themselves and no, no meta and certainly no other programs, nothing like that. So. There's nowhere to configure Wi-Fi or Ethernet, and that's because what we're running right now has no networking support whatsoever, and that raises a whole bunch of very odd questions, right? How does it get email? What's the point of composing an email that you can't send? And, of course, what are we actually running here? I, I mean, it's obviously not Windows, right? But what else could it be? I mean, even Linux would struggle to boot from a spinning disk, mind you, in just like six to eight seconds, at least a Linux that actually has graphics drivers and an X environment and whatnot. So what OS did HP dig up that could pull this off? The answer is nothing. We are running no operating system right now. 
I mean it. And I know some people out there are getting ramped up to argue with whatever I'm gonna say next, because surely I'm just being pedantic or using a strained definition of the term, but I think that once I explain what's going on here, you'll have to agree with me. Let's uh, get back into Windows and we'll be able to see how the back end of this thing works. All right, we're back in Windows 7 and the first thing we're gonna do is open up the real Microsoft Outlook, because as it turns out, Quick Look is not really a complete package. It's totally dependent on Outlook to function. So if we go over and take a look in tasks, all right, there's my task that I made in Quick Look. And if we go over to the calendar, there's the calendar entry I made. And if we go over to contacts, there's my cats. And of course, if we go over to the mail tab and take a look at the outbox, here's the email I was trying to send. And if I were to send a message to this account and I received it in Outlook and then went back to Quick Look, it would be there as well. You see, Quick Look doesn't really do anything on its own. It's just an interface to Outlook. And that makes a lot of sense if you think about it. In most business environments, Outlook is used with an Exchange server. And Exchange is a monstrously complex product with thousands of features. And that's not a joke. It's amazing all the things it can do. So assuming that Microsoft would even let a third party connect to it, the effort of implementing all those features is ridiculous. And while it is possible, I think, to talk to Exchange with a generic IMAP client, you'd have to duplicate a ton of effort. I mean, do you wanna download all your emails in Windows and then again in Quick Look? And when your credentials get reset on the domain, do you wanna to have to log in twice in both clients? What if you send an email from Outlook while you're disconnected from the network and then you boot up into Quick Look? That email won't be in your outbox because the server's unreachable. I mean, I could spend all day listing synchronization issues that this approach would cause, but in short, it would be such a mess that it wouldn't be worth the effort. And besides all that, writing an email client is just really hard and nobody wants to do it, so HP didn't. They made a shell of an email client that leverages Outlook to do all the heavy lifting. But even that isn't as straightforward as it might seem. See, the first theory you might have had, uh, certainly the one I did, is that Quick Look just reads your Outlook profile. But there's a laundry list of problems with that. It's a complicated format, it's meant only to be consumed by Outlook, and it has to contain the entirety of its capabilities, so we're back to the same problem. HP didn't want to spend their time implementing support for every single Exchange feature, like surveys or link invites. Also, the Outlook profile could be 40 gigs or 100 gigs, and I don't know if there's any approved method for a third-party app to edit an Outlook data store, so if you just try to wing it and screw up, you could get sued for billions in damages and probably lose. So reading the file could be hard. Writing to it is completely out of the question. Like, no, you're not doing that. So HP did this the right way. When you install Quick Look, it finds your existing copy of Outlook 03 or 07 and installs a plugin. Outlook plugins are allowed to read and write to your profile through formal, safe APIs. So this plugin can see all your emails and tasks and whatnot. You just have to be in Windows with Outlook open for it to happen. This up here is the toolbar for the Quick Look plugin, and if we pull this up, it asks how often we want to capture data from Outlook and how much data we want to capture. And if we exit this and hit the Export Now button, it says it's collecting data. So it bundles up all my emails and tasks and whatnot, and it exports them somewhere. If we go over to the second hard drive partition, which is called HP Tools, we have a folder for Quick Look, and then inside there, we've got a whole bunch of XML files. We have one called data directory, which identifies what's in the other XMLs. So we've got contacts, tasks, calendar, email. So AC93, that's the email store. Let's open that up. And here's all my emails. This is the subject. Uh, we have the from email and name. Uh, there's a to email in there somewhere. And then the body is stored here in base 64. Uh, that's a UTF-16 LE encoding, by the way. And when we fire up Quick Look, it just reads these files. When we send an email, it's really just writing it to one of these files. And when we next start Real Outlook, the plugin reads these XMLs, and if it finds any messages waiting to go out, then it copies them into new emails and sends them, and it copies over any new or altered tasks, and so on. And this is a very clean way to do things. It's actually one of the less disgusting hacks that we've seen in this series. And while Quick Look can't replicate all of Outlook's functionality, nor can it be online all the time, 
2010 was pretty much the last year, I'd say, when a business executive could get away with not being online all the time. A lot of business people still didn't have universal cellular data and were still hopping between Wi-Fi oases. So while it might seem completely wild to imagine writing a bunch of emails while you're out and about and then having to buffer them until you can get back to somewhere with a power outlet and ethernet jack to actually send them, it wasn't yet totally absurd. But Quick Look is definitely the dying gasp of a past era. It's a fading memory of hot sinking email from your Palm Pilot so you can send it with Eudora. But I think it still might have made up a, a whiff of sense at this point. It still leaves us though with the question of what exactly it is. And the answer is simple enough, but only if you have a bunch of pre-existing knowledge, which I will have to attempt to summarize. See, if we just go up two folders here, the answer's right there. This is Quick Look and it's an EFI file. Now, some people know what that means. You're dismissed. You can skip to the day starter chapter. You'll like that. But since I had no idea what this meant until I researched it for this episode, I'm gonna assume a lot of other people don't either. So bear with me while I explain a little bit about how modern PCs boot. I'm gonna explain a lot of it. It's gonna be a lot of talking. Sorry. If you're not much of a computer person, or if you've tuned out of this entire process, for which I don't blame you, this is the short of it. You know the term BIOS? Yeah, those don't exist anymore. The original 1981 IBM PC had a thing called a BIOS, which is what we'd now call firmware. It was a chunk of code responsible for bootstrapping the machine, performing a bunch of housekeeping, and even acting as a, a little tiny bit of what we'd now call a hardware abstraction layer. And for the next 25 years, every PC contained vestiges of that BIOS. If you got a Core 2 Duo machine in 2007, when you powered it up, it did pretty much the same things in the same order as a 1981 IBM PC, using code that was remarkably similar, though legally distinct, uh, from what came on that machine. And only after all that finished did it start running code that was written in the 21st century. But all this changed a long time ago. It was a drawn out process, it took eons to fully complete, and it was deliberately made as invisible as possible. But there are now many computers being sold that have no trace of the original PC BIOS whatsoever, no support for software that depended on it. These machines instead run UEFI, a completely new from scratch firmware that began shipping in consumer PCs in the late 2000s and is now totally universal. You can still get computers that are capable of running BIOS code, but only through something called the CSM, or Compatibility Support Module, which is entirely optional and often disabled by default. But it's very easy to not have noticed that this happened, because it was deliberately invisible. UEFI firmwares were often designed to look nearly identical to legacy BIOS, and long before they even began shipping, BIOS machines started hiding their startup text behind splash screens. So most people probably never noticed that the PC they bought in 2011 was fundamentally different under the hood from the one they had five years earlier. The biggest difference you're likely to have noticed was when you bought a new motherboard and the CMOS setup, instead of being a tired 1980s text mode interface, was instead a graphical one that looked like the box for a GeForce 4 and was probably much harder to navigate than what you were using before. These garish new setup programs are often a step backwards from what we had, but they do have some advantages. One you might have noticed is the improved boot selector. Instead of just shuffling raw hard drive models around, or worse, just choosing from things like HDD or CD-ROM, you can now just pick Windows Boot Manager or Arch Linux, and then just pick the thing you actually want with no guesswork involved. This probably isn't a huge improvement to your day-to-day -day life, but it's nice, and you might have wondered how it became possible. Well, the old PC BIOS was very simplistic. I mean, it was made 43 years ago, all right? And even the best enhancements on it were still stuck in an 80s mindset. So BIOS had no understanding of concepts like file systems. When you started up your PC in 81 or 2004, the only thing it knew was which mass storage devices were connected. And it would try to boot by just looking at each one in turn, reading the first sector and seeing if there was bootstrap code there. If not, then you'd get a message like no bootable devices found and that was it. 
To make your hard drive bootable, you had to add a master boot record, which required special tools and was, in general, a completely opaque process even to most technical people. UEFI changed all of this. It does have an intrinsic understanding of file systems. So when you boot up your PC now, the firmware checks your disks for a GPT, the thing that replaced that master boot record. And if it finds one, then it checks each listed partition to see if it has a supported file system. And if it does, then it looks for a folder called EFI with another folder inside called boot. The contents of that folder are .EFI files, and these are just EXEs. I mean, I'm not joking, they literally use the same format as Windows binaries, but the code inside isn't for Windows. It's intended for the UEFI firmware itself. EFIs are programs that are executed directly by your motherboard firmware. And this isn't a new concept. Computers have always had software that worked like this. Going back to BIOS for a moment, the term meant basic input-output system, and that's exactly what it was. It was a set of very simple tools to take input from the keyboard and disk drives and send output to a monitor or serial or parallel ports without a software developer needing to do all the work themselves to talk to that hardware. Like I said, it was sort of like what we now call a HAL. It isolates the programmer from the exact details of the underlying system, but it was very thin and very basic indeed. It never had robust support for graphical display modes, at least until the Visa organization got involved in the early 90s. Things like USB keyboards and mice and mass storage were always bolted on hacks, more on that later, and there was nothing like sound or networking support. But in the early days of the PC, this wasn't a problem. The BIOS let you talk to pretty much everything you could expect to find in the first few years of the platform. So for a while, people wrote programs that did all their input and output through BIOS system calls, so they never needed to interact directly with any hardware. And some of this software didn't even require DOS. MS-DOS and PC-DOS offered their own whole abstraction layer that sat on top of the BIOS, and some devs never bothered with that. They shipped software on floppy disks that you booted instead of DOS. And I mean, several of those didn't even bother with the BIOS. They did touch the hardware directly, but that's a, a different story. The point is, these programs didn't need an operating system at all. In retrospect, these have been termed booter apps, and there were relatively few of them, but they did exist. Also, when you fired up a PC in 1998, for instance, and hit delete, the CMOS setup program that popped up was also a program that ran without an OS. It was part of the BIOS itself, and it used the same code to interface with hardware. And by 2004, you might even have had a machine with a built-in BIOS flashing utility. Those were also OS-less applications, as were the management tools built into hard drive controllers, among other things. So the PC has a long history of simple software that can run without any OS assistance. Now, UEFI has continued this trend, but it offers much better capabilities. It added built-in support for high-resolution video, USB peripherals and storage devices, networking, and many other things, and even more functionality can be added through its driver framework. It's all stuff you could add to a BIOS system, but UEFI makes these formal, first-class features that are much easier to work with. Those modern CMOS setup programs with the garish backgrounds and the fake analog meters for overclocking and whatnot, those are EFI applications. The graphics are drawn with UEFI's Graphics Output Protocol, or GOP. The mouse works through the Simple Pointer Protocol. There's rich built-in support for things like Unicode text parsing and rendering with loadable fonts, and it can even read the actual file systems on any of your mass storage devices. So, in other words, UEFI is sort of like an operating system? I mean, okay, so I said you wouldn't be able to nitpick this, but I guess this nit could be picked. Is UEFI an OS? I mean, it provides a ton of functionality. It can execute applications. I mean, as far as I know, it's not multitasking, but that's never been a requirement, so it really gets confusing. But when it comes down to it, operating system is just not that firmly defined a concept, and it's changed over time, particularly in the mid-90s when protected mode became dominant. So by any modern interpretation, for instance, MS-DOS wasn't an operating system. Given that the UEFI replaced the BIOS and nobody ever claimed that was an OS, I think we have to conclude that EFI apps are OS-less. You have a single program with total control over the computer, just like those booter apps from the 80s. Those could get as complex as you liked, and so can these. Uh, for instance, the UEFI upgrade led to a lot of business machines, including sophisticated self-diagnostics that were possible before, but much less capable and less common because they were much harder to make. So, with all that context, it's not all that shocking that Quick Look is also an EFI application.
When you press that special little power button, HP's customized firmware is hard-coded to look for a file with the path HP Tools Quick Look, Quick Look EFI, and boot from it. And once it starts, it's the only thing the machine is running. HP not only cloned Outlook, they made a version of it that doesn't depend on any Windows APIs, just system firmware. And that seems wild at first glance, but it's not really that much of a hack. In fact, it's quite cleanly done. There were worse ways to do this for sure, and it does achieve a super fast boot time because it doesn't need to load any drivers. It's just a single three megabyte executable that depends entirely on code that's literally a permanent part of the computer's memory space. So yeah, this is honestly a very clever and impressive solution. Of course, there are some downsides. For one thing, this is probably to some extent why it needs that Outlook plugin and doesn't just read your data store directly. I mean, writing that file is still a very bad idea, but I can imagine HP at least trying to read it if they could. But at this point in time, Windows installs were pretty much universally using the NTFS file system, which they wouldn't have been able to read easily from within an EFI app. Now, to be clear, there are some misconceptions out there about this. UEFI has built-in support for the FAT32 file system. Per the specifications, it's mandatory. But a lot of people interpret that to mean it can only ever read FAT32. This isn't strictly true. Nothing stops someone from shipping firmware with an NTFS or EXT4 driver. I believe it actually has been done. It's also been done as a third-party thing. Uh, the guy who develops Rufus, the USB image writing tool, also develops a driver to make bootable NTFS flash drives. So it was feasible for HP to just read the OS partition and find the user's Outlook profile, but I don't know that a driver for that would have been available as open source software or even commercial software in 2010 when this machine was made. FAT32 is the only reliable file system it can depend on, so the HP tools folder has to live on a FAT32 partition so UEFI can see it, and that means it has to be a separate one from the Windows drive. So these are all just ordinary files. And an interesting side effect is that you don't technically need Outlook to create them. Uh, you know, none of these files are special. They aren't blessed in any way, nor is the partition itself. HP published a document explaining how to create that partition yourself. And the only requirement is that it be FAT32 and have the name HP Tools. That's it. And you know, part of the point of UEFI was to get rid of any of that behind the scenes, you know, mucking about any of the blessed files or hidden boot records or anything like that. If you want to see this in action, it's real easy. Just go download any modern Linux ISO like uh, Fedora, Ubuntu, any of them, uh, get a FAT32 USB drive, extract the ISO to it and put it in a machine. It'll boot just fine. Doesn't need any special tools. You don't need to use Rufus. You don't need to use Belina Etcher. None of that. The presence of the files is enough because there's a folder called EFI with a folder called boot in it with some EFI files in it. And that's the only thing that your firmware looks for. And you can actually do this with Windows 10 as well, although it does get a little weirder with Windows 11 for reasons that I won't go into. Now, there is one thing that has to be blessed. That's the EFI for Quick Look itself. It has to be digitally signed by HP, and this is irritating because it means I wasn't able to replace it with the version of Doom that someone ported to an EFI executable. I was irritated about that, but HP has a pretty good argument that the partition is just, you know, there and any program in Windows could overwrite these files with compromised ones. And then if you boot it into Quick Look, they would have total control over your system with literally no way to stop them, which maybe suggests that this isn't a great way to deliver application software, but let's not get too sidetracked there. All of this can be that simple because EFI is modern software. It's not a taped together pile of hacks based on 40 year old code that only barely understands X64 and thinks it's booting from a floppy drive or a cassette. UEFI doesn't need a hand up from absurd pre-boot bodgery. This whole arrangement is working as the platform designers intended. EFI applications are legit. So there's nothing stopping you from writing your own script that reads a mail file from Thunderbird or Pine and produces those same XML files. Quick Look won't care. I mean, not of course that you'd want to do that. I mean, it's not good. For one thing, it's slow. For all of UEFI's benefits, the APIs are very simplistic. So just like your graphical CMOS setup, the screen updates very sluggishly. The mouse can't even move smoothly. It's like 10 or 15 FPS. And of course, the underlying thing that this is meant to achieve, the quick boot time, is totally irrelevant now. I mean, modern Windows or Linux can cold boot off an SSD in eight seconds or less. So you don't actually want this. 
and probably nobody really wanted it when it was new either, but it was technically impressive. Also, to its credit, it looks really good. The software itself is very clean and professionally designed. It doesn't suffer too badly from flat UI syndrome. You've got legible black text on a white background. Um, objects have borders. There's uh, clean banners and nice typography. It's honestly the least embarrassing thing we've seen in the entire Quick Start series by a long shot. HP more or less stuck the landing on this one. So obviously it's time for them to fall flat on their faces in a pile of dog shit and have their pants fly off and show everyone their ass because we're not done here. Quick look is the tame feature. It's now time to look at Daystarter, a crime against humanity. I saw this on HP's website while looking for quick look and the description made my blood run cold. HP Daystarter displays Microsoft Outlook calendar information and custom messages while Windows loads. I'm still reeling from the idea that someone would try to do this, but if you've been paying attention, you already know that it works. I have it installed and you saw it briefly earlier, but we'll take another look. I'm gonna shut the machine down and restart. All right, we're gonna boot Windows like normal. All right, that is HP Daystarter. And it disappears as soon as the system finishes booting, so let's take a look at a frame grab here. So we have a full screen image of the Outlook calendar. And of course, a lot of people probably think they know how this was achieved already. And you know, I assume the best here as well, right? The obvious guess is that they're doing the age old practice of replacing the Windows boot splash. It's a real simple idea. Windows loads a file from the hard drive and displays it during the boot sequence. And you can replace that file with whatever you want. I first did this with Windows 95 when I was nine years old. It's a venerable practice and it's a pretty clever idea, honestly. I think it was even Microsoft's official approach to branding a machine up until UEFI added a place in firmware where you can put an image that Windows will load automatically. So as we'd expect, the Outlook plugin also has a day starter section and we can choose how much data we wanna capture and, and when it should start. And when we hit okay, it asks if we want to capture data now. So, okay, it takes a snapshot of our calendar, it converts it into a 256 color bitmap, and it spits it into the Windows folder, overriding the Windows 7 boot splash. Very simple idea, and not what they're doing at all. I mean, <laughs> come on, I wouldn't even waste your time with that. <laughs> See, it actually renders your calendar to the HP Tools partition into the Daystarter folder as a JPEG, and in fact, a whole bunch of JPEGs. There's no way that Windows is reading these files on startup, and if we take a look at that boot screen again a little bit closer, here in the upper right corner, those are function keys. This takes user input during boot. Here, I'll show you. You remember earlier I said that the uh, day starter goes by too fast for us to get a good look at it? Well, we can fix that. We just press F4 and it pauses the Windows boot process. If you don't have a pit in your stomach right now, it's because you don't know the technical horror on display here. So. Listen closely and don't mistake this for exaggeration. What we just saw is not possible. Welcome to Quick Start. Not only have we paused the Windows boot process, but this is actually supposed to let you flip between several days of calendar entries. I don't know why it isn't working right now, but when I hit the arrow keys, the screen just blanks and it continues with the boot process, but it was working before. And there's just no way to do that. In order to communicate to you how horrifying this is, I really need to explain a lot about how computers work. So bear with me. Okay, so the kids these days are always talking about their ding dang multitasking. These days it sure seems like computers can run a million programs at once, but they can't. It's an illusion and it was always an illusion. Your computer is a heavily dressed up version of a Turing machine, a theoretical model for computing in which you have a machine that can do nothing other than look at a strip of tape containing instructions, move forward and backwards along that tape, and then based on the instruction in each cell, it can either write a new value to that cell or halt processing. That concept was developed by Alan Turing in 1936 and the distance between it and the way your computer works now is narrower than anyone would like to imagine. It's certainly true during the boot process and even more so in 2010. When your PC first starts up, the CPU is hardwired to look at a specific spot in its memory map and execute whatever it finds there. 
Used to be that's where we put the BIOS. Nowadays, it's where we put the UEFI. Either way, as soon as the CPU powers on, the firmware takes over, it does a quick self-check, and then it starts looking for a boot drive. Once it finds one, it points the CPU to the boot code. That usually points it to the primary operating system, in this case, the Windows kernel, which it begins consuming and executing. And at this point in the process, your multi-core 64-bit CPU with hyper-threading is functionally no different than a MOS 6502 from 1979. It's a Turing machine. Once again, it's just a really fast one that takes very big bites out of the tape, but it's the same thing. Each word of machine code from the Windows kernel is executed in order. The CPU does exactly what Microsoft tells it to do and nothing else. And then the instruction pointer either advances or jumps to another location that is also a place that Microsoft told it to go. The entire process works like this. As long as Windows is booting, it is in absolute and total control of the entire system. There are no cracks into which to get one's fingers. Asking a question like, how do we run our own program while the kernel is booting is like asking, how do I push my hand through this brick wall? It's not worth discussing because the outcome is predetermined. The code that draws the animated logo while your PC is booting is some of the dumbest, lowest level code your computer will ever run. Even if HP developed a kernel driver that tried to overwrite the boot splash, it would probably either trigger a crash or it wouldn't be able to execute often enough to keep the frame buffer from getting stomped by the kernel boot splash code because the kernel just wouldn't call it very frequently and it can't run unless the kernel lets it. Nothing is allowed to have preemptive control of the CPU at this stage of boot, so the answer is no, you may not do this. You are not allowed to. By physics, it is structurally impossible on the PC platform. The CPU isn't wired in a way that permits it. I admit I may be overstating this a bit, but I assure you I am close enough to the mark. This is, in every practical sense, impossible. And any solution you can think of is fragile and a bad idea. And yet, HP did it. Somehow. How? I mean, the first guess is that they hacked Windows. No, no, they didn't, they, they can't. That's not how this works. That's not how any of this works. For one thing, all the relevant files are gated behind WRP, which aggressively replaces any crucial OS file the moment it's modified. And even if HP got past that, it would break updates forever. The moment Microsoft patched anything, HP would have to rush out a new version of their hack. So no, 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 they didn't do that. No, no. And that doesn't leave very much. Like, honestly, I, I had no idea how they pulled this off. No guesses at all, just a total brick wall. And nobody else that I talked to got even close to the answer because the answer is so horrifying that you really wouldn't think they'd do it. We don't have full documentation on how this hack works, but HP published just enough to suss out the details. And if you could believe this, it's worse than Phoenix hyperspace. HP put Daystarter in the goddamned system management mode. Now, you may not have heard of SMM. I had never heard of SMM before this. Apparently, however, it was introduced all the way back on the 386SL CPU to implement power management features because Intel wanted a way for the CPU to interrupt itself in a way that couldn't be overridden even by the operating system to run code to do maintenance on the system. And that's, again, not really possible in the architecture as they developed it. 386 class CPUs have a permissions system where code is separated into different rings of privilege. I'll leave out the many details, but in short, what you need to know is that Windows applications, for instance, live in ring three and the kernel lives in ring zero and that means the kernel has absolute authority. If a program tries to access memory that it's not allowed to touch or to take control of the CPU for longer than it's permitted, the OS kernel can simply step in and say, no, you don't do that. And that's the final word. This also affects multitasking. The only reason computers appear to run multiple programs at once is because the operating system has a scheduler, which parcels out time on the CPU to each task in turn. If the kernel decides that a program isn't getting any cycles, that program isn't getting them. It's frozen until the OS decides to give it some time. And if the kernel decides that it wants to just hog the CPU for six solid minutes, that's its prerogative. Nothing else can argue with it. The only way to interrupt the kernel in this state is with an interrupt, a hardware signal that forces the CPU to stop what it's doing and service a request from a device. 
Now the kernel can mask most of those interrupts so that even hardware can't interfere with its plans, but there is always a thing called a non-maskable interrupt, which as the name implies, is a final, no questions asked, no shit bailout. If something triggers an NMI, even the kernel has to yield to it. Well, the trouble is this new power management feature demanded a way to run code that took precedence over everything else, including hardware needs, because Intel wanted to do meta stuff. They wanted to turn peripherals on and off on the fly to save power. This was intended for laptops, right? So if you didn't use your hard drive for a while, uh, they wanted to shut it off to save power, but then when a program tried to access it, something needed to turn it back on. And since no software understood these new features, it needed to be done in a way that was completely transparent. So Intel added code that executes periodically and turns off hardware devices if they have haven't been used in a while, and they added code that gets triggered whenever a program tries to access those devices. So if something tries to touch the hard drive when it's asleep, then that code kicks in, takes over, wakes the drive up, restores any necessary state to the controller, and then once it's ready to use, control is released back to the application and it continues operating with no idea that it's just been suspended and resumed, possibly for several seconds. So this was a great solution, but what if the kernel doesn't relinquish control to the power management code? Or what if an NMI happens during the wake up process and the power management code loses control of the system? Really bad things could happen. So Intel needed something more powerful than the kernel, more powerful than an NMI. And thus the SMM was born, a new level of privilege often referred to as ring minus two. To put it simply, code running in the SMM is more powerful than God. It has absolute authority to run anytime it likes and to override any system behavior. It ignores non-maskable interrupts. It cannot be disabled or monitored. It is all powerful and answers to nobody. Naturally, this worries some people. The SMM is a secret ruling body, a star chamber, uninspectable, undetectable, and it can control your entire system at a whim, subject to no oversight. That's terrifying, and in the decades to follow, Intel has added several more similarly terrifying features, including AMT, which people refer to as Ring Minus 3, even more powerful than the SMM, and even less inspectable. If someone were to sneak malware into these components, you would be screwed six ways from Sunday. Naturally, this has happened, but let's not dwell on that. Let's go back to HP's malfeasance. Per this slide in an HP presentation, it appears that the firmware on this laptop includes special SMM code that detects when supported versions of Windows are booting and begins overwriting the frame buffer until the boot process has completed. And that's all we know for sure. It's just this one slide, it's not very detailed, and I couldn't find any other information about it, so all I can do is speculate, but some of this just follows, right? Windows 7, as I understand it, never got full UEFI support, but this machine boots it in CSM mode, which means that UEFI is still in control throughout the process. So the code in the SMM has access to all of its capabilities, including the FAT32 file system driver, but it also has total authority to touch any part of system memory. So when you boot your PC, the day starter code executes in the SMM and it starts sniffing memory to see if Windows is booting. This would have had to have been a heuristic, something where a guy sat and analyzed the Windows boot process with a debugger and said, okay, we don't see these memory values here until the boot splash appears. And when we see these specific values appear, that means the boot splash is gone. Like there's no cleaner way to have done this. So it has to be like that. Okay. Once it detects the boot splash, it hooks the UEFI GOP driver or the Visa BIOS routines that it emulates. And then every time Windows 7 tries to update the screen, it instead diverts into the day starter code. That checks if the user's pressed any keys, it changes the JPEG if need be, then it updates the frame buffer with its chosen graphic. Eventually, when it sees whatever convinces it that Windows has finished booting, it purges itself out of the SMM, we hope, unhooks those video routines, we hope, and the machine continues as normal. Presumably when you hit that pause button, I don't know, I guess it just goes into like a tight loop and won't let the kernel get any more CPU time. Not really sure. Now, perhaps I got some of that wrong. I don't think we'll ever know the truth one way or another, but we can be absolutely certain of one thing. Day starter is a horrifying abuse of a hardware feature that shouldn't exist uh, certainly wasn't intended for this and should never have been used for something so trivial. I'm told that the SMM has largely been ignored as a vector for dumb corporate bullshit. It's mostly used only for its intended purposes with the exception of the BIOS era USB keyboard support that apparently was also an SMM hack, which I think explains a lot about it. But this here, this is absurd and uncalled for.
Putting application code in the SMM is just plain irresponsible. I can't even begin to enumerate the risks. It's, it's all way above my head, to be frank. But at a bare minimum, we can just say that this is interfering with a crucial moment in the OS boot process with what has to be some very sloppy code. Like I said, there's no way this isn't based on heuristics, which means if Microsoft had patched Windows in just the right way, changed some constant that was never meant to be used as a Sentinel value, then this could have fallen apart entirely. At a bare minimum, if it missed the end of the boot process, it could have hung on to the frame buffer all the way to the desktop, rendering the machine unusable. And that's just what I can think of offhand, okay? The sky is the limit here. This is wrong. This is not what we do. This should not be done. It is a bad way to use the computer. Don't do it. But then why would you anyway? What would motivate someone to do this, to put this much effort and risk into a feature this dumb? Because let's be real here, this is useless. What's it getting you, an extra 10 seconds to look at your calendar? You can barely read it in time. I mean, you would have to pause the boot process and at that point, just let it finish and use Outlook. And okay, if Outlook was taking 20 seconds to load, then they could have just bundled a 256 kilobyte application that reads those exact same JPEGs and just displays them on startup. This confers no imaginable benefits whatsoever. Why did they make it? Well, I have two theories. Here's number one. An engineer got excited by UEFI and its new capabilities. They came up with this thing. They were too occupied by whether they could to ask if they should. They showed it to their bosses. They said, cool, ship it, and that's the end of the story. But that one's boring, and I don't think it's very likely to be honest inside a juggernaut like HP. So instead, here's some cynicism. You can skip it if you like. I won't mind. There's nothing here to feel good about. I have a thesis that I've voiced before in various forms that technology as we know it is a phenomenon that happened once upon a time, mostly in the 20th century, and is now coming to a close. The great inventions are invented, and an overwhelming proportion of problems, as far as consumer products go, are solved. Not everyone can afford those solutions, and many solutions won't get made because they aren't sufficiently profitable. These are not in dispute. I'm not saying there's nothing left for us to do as a species. I'm saying that we're never going to see another Walkman, a device so deeply altering what you can do in your day-to-day -day life that stores can't keep it on the shelves. I believe that our culture is so deeply formed around consumer technology that when we run out of new gadgets to buy, we won't know what to do with ourselves anymore. And this is already happening. The basic loop for over a century went like this. You, industry, invent a vacuum cleaner. You then convince a bunch of people, hopefully everyone, that a vacuum cleaner will make them happy. You now make a lot of profit by selling vacuum cleaners. Oops! Market saturation, everyone has a vacuum, nobody needs a new one. They work for a long time, and even when they break, there's now 30 companies selling equivalent cleaners. So why would someone buy another one of yours? Well, to solve this problem, you invent a new vacuum with a stronger motor or a quieter motor, a bigger hose, a better beater, less weight, etc. You tell everyone the new vacuum cleaner will make them happy again, and if you're lucky, they all buy yours and not someone else's, bam, you make a lot of profit. Well. What happens when the perfect vacuum cleaner is discovered? The whole theory of capitalism centers around the idea of continuous improvement, but I argue that this has actually happened, that vacuums got as good as they could conceivably get decades ago, and nobody has any idea how to compete anymore, so they're all losing their minds. It's reached the point where you can't buy a good vacuum cleaner anymore because they're all so deeply entrenched in the drive to compete in a space where competition is logically impossible that they've trended away from the solved problems. This gets worse when you consider the perspective of a company like HP, even 20 years ago. What did their job look like? Okay, you assemble a thing out of parts that you had nothing to do with. An Intel CPU and chipset, Realtek Audio, NVIDIA GPU, Western Digital Hard Drive. Then you convince people that your machine is what? The cheapest? The most reliable? Question marks? And then hopefully you make profit by selling the exact same thing that your competition does. Yeah, it's, it's broken. The whole latter part of the loop is missing. How does HP convince you that their machine is better when it can't be? 
because HP doesn't make anything. They can't make anything. Their product is metal boxes, plastic trim, and motherboards. Everything else they sell is a jelly bean, a part that some other company made that all other vendors also have access to. CPUs, chipsets, hard drives, LCD screens. These all do specific things that need to work exactly the way they all already do. Nobody wants a round LCD, so every screen is identical except in matters of degree, resolution, brightness, color quality, size, dot pitch, etc. But there are no local maxima possible. We know what the best screen for a business machine is, and the only difference between a given HP and a given Dell is whether they did or didn't choose the objectively correct part. If you buy the machine with the 1366 by 768 display, you got something that is simply worse than it could have been. The only stuff that HP has editorial input on are the metal boxes, the plastic trim, and there's really not that much you can do with those. And motherboards are even worse. They have to be exactly the same in every machine in existence because they're just plugging together jelly bean parts and then it has to run someone else's software. So the firmware has to be 100% functionally identical to every other machine. This is why motherboard CMOS setups got those wacky graphical backgrounds and inscrutable controls because it was literally the only thing they were able to make their own, so they poured all the mustard they had on it because what else can you do when you're otherwise invisible? Like at least with laptops, they could do stuff with the case, right? Like the Elite Books have this little pop-out LED here that illuminates the keyboard, it's absolutely adorable, it's delightful. And uh, IBM had them in like 1999 because it's a really obvious idea. It's like one of the most obvious ideas possible and it's yet another jelly bean part. Hey, you know what else we have? White LEDs, put those in there somewhere. So what's next after that? What do you, what do you add? Because most people don't really want anything more than a mouse, a keyboard, a set of speakers, and a monitor. And everything already has those, and they're all very good already. If HP could think of something new to add, it would just be something you could plug in with USB or Thunderbolt, and virtually everything that you can imagine of that sort is already being sold. Basically, the only problems left to solve with the entire category of PCs is minor aspects of convenience. How many ports, where they are, whether they're on the back or the side, etc. So, imagine being a product designer at HP in the very late 2000s. Some VP storms in and goes, we have to deliver features for executives. We're selling them $2,500 notebooks, but Dells have all the same ins and outs. We need features. What do you do? Well, there's only one thing you can do. You stare at the guy and you muster up the courage to say, Bob, we're a motherboard. We're a turnkey. We're in the middle. We don't get to have features. Our business is selling invisible, unnoticeable plinths whose sole purpose is to hold up a copy of Microsoft Office. And that's the truth. The trouble is, it's not what Bob wants to hear because he wants a bonus. He got hired for a Sisyphean job and he's realizing this. He will never be in charge of an important headline feature because there won't ever be one. He works for a company that makes widgets. Bob is in hell and he's making it your problem. So he tells you you're fired and then he turns to the next person and he says the same thing and fires him if need be and he repeats until someone blurts out the dumbest idea they've ever had in a cold panic. Because executives run Outlook, that's their job. The job of a CEO is to send emails and Outlook is how you do that at a job. So you can't sell executives anything. I mean, what, are you gonna offer them more RAM? Outlook runs fine in four gigs even now and especially then. More CPU, same answer. Outlook runs on a Core 2 Duo. A GPU, for what? To render graphs? There's nothing to sell to a person who could still do their job on a computer from 2004. So when you blurt out, uh, what if we made Outlook start faster? Bob's gonna go, there you go, do that. It's, it's the Poochie episode from The Simpsons. It's always been like this. But how do you make Outlook faster? I mean, you can't. It's impossible. Microsoft controls the whole machine, let alone Outlook. HP can't stick their fingers in and somehow enhance that experience. So they touch the only thing they actually have domain over, the pre-boot experience. Up until Windows starts, HP is still in control. Their firmware is still executing. That's the only crack they could get their fingers into and they were starving. 
Does it make sense to write a whole bare metal application that runs raw on the CPU just so an executive doesn't have to wait an extra 10 seconds to read their email? Of course not. They're not gonna use it, okay? They're just gonna boot into Windows. They're gonna ignore that button entirely. But HP needs a feature because Bob needs a feature. So they make one of the only standalone EFI applications in history so that department can say that they shipped something. And then they're out of ideas. We made Quasi Outlook. It loads in eight seconds. And six months later, ah shit, Bob needs another bonus. We gotta do something. Well, um, uh, well, okay, we can't make Windows boot faster, but can, can we run code while it's booting? No? Well, shit, we're all out of a job then. So someone figure it out. And so they did. It's the only lever they could pull. There were no others, so they pulled that one. What else do you do when your job, your industry has been obsolete for years? I mean, don't get me wrong. There are good engineers doing good engineering at HP, okay? Maybe you work there designing motherboards, terrific. Someone has to figure out how to plug together the jelly beans. It's a hard job, but at the end of the day, it's the same thing everybody else is doing. It's no different than the car industry. Hyundai, Dodge, Honda, Toyota, they're all employing skilled engineers to do real work, but they're all working on the same problems and they're gonna solve them to about the same level of satisfaction, except where they've been denied access to the known ideal solutions due to economics or IP law. It's duplicated effort on a good day. We don't need dozens of car manufacturers. We know how to make good engines, sturdy frames, and comfortable upholstery, and every company is within a few points of each other, except where they're egregiously doing a bad job solely because Bob needs a bonus and can only achieve that by shaking up something that was already fine the way it was. Middle management has a vested interest in unsolving the solved because individuals profit from creating chaos, which can then be made to look like progress. And so it is for the dozens of computer companies still in business. We don't need this many. They all make the same thing, except where they've cut corners in a desperate attempt to compete in a market where competition is definitionally impossible. The only actual innovations come from the people making the silicon, and they themselves are unable to cope with the fact that they've saturated the market 10 times over and that by and large, people don't really need new computers anymore. The industry has stagnated to a shocking degree. I have computers from 2016 that I couldn't actually tell you are that old without looking up their components because the parts look the same, the software runs the same, the increase in speed over the years is negligible for most intents and purposes, and most problems have been solved to most people's satisfaction. Eight years ago, your boot drive could be a half terabyte of solid state storage, and that same drive is still perfectly good today for almost everyone. And sure, not everyone has a computer that's even as good as a top of the line one from 2016, but it's only due to economics bullshit. Enough computers of that quality were made for everyone, yes, everyone to have one. And they're going in landfills because it's not profitable to get them to the people who would use them. And there's nowhere to go next. PC technology has rocketed past what the majority of people actually need. We're now doing the equivalent of putting 600 horsepower engines in golf carts, and there's simply no reason anyone would want or even notice a 700 horsepower upgrade. How have corporations not noticed this? And what rash decisions will they make once they accept this inevitable truth? I don't like thinking about it because I think that this HP thing is a picture of what happened the last time they felt this cornered. In my opinion, we can expect to see a lot more of this bizarre flailing as time goes on. I was actually shocked that all this happened at the specific time that it did, really, because 2010 was a significantly more interesting era in the history of the PC. The UEFI switchover was happening, we were finishing the migration to PCI Express, USB 3 was becoming commonplace, suddenly the average computer could do things that it just couldn't do a year earlier. It was a great time to upgrade your PC if you hadn't done so in a few years, and a great time to be selling upgraded PCs. So it seemed weird that HP would feel the need to produce something this baldly desperate. Well, as it turns out, and I only discovered this very late in the script writing process, so I figured I'd just leave it until now. I, I, th I think it makes things weightier. A uh, quick look is actually a feature from 2007 where it makes way more sense and it actually does make it fit into the series. Hooray! <laughs> HP was probably still shipping this just because of momentum, but it makes a lot more sense as a 2007 feature because yeah, by 2010, HP probably did feel a lot of relief from the doldrums of the late Core 2 era, but that relief certainly would have faded later on. And at this point, I wonder just what their product designers do all day. I can't even picture it. 
But anyway, that's my fairy tale. I have no real information. I made all that up and I have no expectation of ever getting any real answers. I'm sorry this video ended up just being an hour of me talking, but what else can you do when all, all the secrets are under the hood, right? The actual features here are laughably simple compared to the titanic effort put in to make them possible, maybe to a greater degree than anything else in this series. This was a massive lift to achieve a very simple outcome. And it's particularly absurd when you think that this was being sold in the same year as the iPhone 4. Wow. But that's all I have to say about it. So if you made it through all that, thank you very much for your patience. And if you enjoyed my TED Talk, uh, consider subscribing to my channel. It's not always me going off about the death spiral of modern society. Sometimes it's just me looking at little computers. Uh, but if you really enjoyed this and you wanna make sure there's more of it, then consider supporting me on Patreon like these people here are doing. This is my full-time job. These folks are paying for my groceries, my gas, my rent, and for me to find weird devices like this pull them out of the garbage and bring them home to show to you. I am incredibly grateful to all my supporters for making this possible. Thank you all so much and everyone else. Thanks for watching.